you so much. This is a phenomenal uh, event, and I want to thank all everyone who had a part in helping this um, event become institutionalized and helping it grow to this extent. It's wonderful. And I just want to say that I heard, this can't be true, but I heard that 70 HP employees were bused here. Is that possible? Oh my goodness. Wow. Now, all of you other companies, you'll know next year uh, to get a bus and to load it up with women. Uh, and you better, s and men, okay. And men, I'm sorry. Women and men. Um, and in the meantime, permit me to say this at least. Hire more women so you can do that easily. Okay, good. As a former president of Smith College, uh, as you heard, the largest women's college in the country, I'm so delighted to be part of the celebration of International Women's Day because this day celebrates the achievements of women when I retired from my position as president of Brown University, I actually thought my days of achievement were behind me. I imagined a life of leisure, contemplating the joys of my decades of leadership in higher education. You see, I left home when I was 17, and I hadn't lived in Houston um, since, since then, since I graduated from Phyllis Wheatley High School. Oh, yeah. Wheatley rules. <laughs> Anything you hear about Jack Yates, it's not true. It's Wheatley. The chance to reacquaint myself with the city and my family was also drawing me back to settle in the city. And as I returned, I was immediately drawn to the places of my youth. And these visits rekindled the memories of the extraordinary experiences I had as a girl here in Houston. Now, I didn't think them extraordinary at the time. It was not, wasn't until decades later that I would come to understand how much one should appreciate the unique and life-affirming aspects of one's life. The little things that we experience as children and beyond that shape who we are, that give us strength every day as we go through life. As I returned to my old neighborhood in Fifth Ward, it struck me in a new way how far I had traveled both metaphorically and physically. I recognized when I came back and I walked through those streets in Fifth Ward that the overwhelming odds of my achieving su success when I was here were so low that it would have been perverse for me to aspire to anything like what I've done in my life. But luckily, people intervened in my life and purposefully overturned those odds. It was through their good care and support that upon graduation from Wheatley, I was pushed to go to college. It was such a radical idea at the time. People around me, particularly teachers, secured a scholarship for me. They packed my bags, and they ushered me into an unknown world, more confident than I was that I could succeed. I talk a lot about these teachers because I, I think, honestly, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't have done it without them. They went into their closets took their clothes out of their closets and packed a bag for me to go to college. Think of that. <laughs> Teachers. Everyone I knew at the time was a laborer or maid doing day's work. So too were my parents. So imagine people putting in my head that I could actually go to college and aspire to a career of my choosing. In an era of trenchant segregation, 
and low expectations for African Americans, this was indeed a radical idea. So my journey, fueled by the high standards that my teachers and other supporters set for me, has now taken me through a career in higher education where I have applied many of my, the lessons that I took from my early life. From my stalwart parents, wow, I always say to punctuate how important their care was that every one of their 12 children lived to adulthood because they taught us how to survive in a brutal, segregated environment. Amazing. And then there were teacher mentors in Houston. I understood from my parents and these teachers that self-reliance and independence of mind would be an important asset for me in life. That, with standards of achievement far more ambitious than others thought reasonable, would fuel my journey from Dillard to Harvard, from the Saltillo Institute in Mexico to the University of Lyon in France. So the first 15 years of my life in a segregated environment, I learned easily and was amply rewarded for achieving consistently high grades. But it wasn't until I was faced with academic challenges, however, that I started on the path to leadership. I once tried to drop a class because it was far too difficult. But my teacher, a French, refused to allow me to drop it. Now, I called him all kinds of names, not to, him, to his face. <laughs> what an unfeeling person to see that I'm having so much difficulty and not to allow me to drop the class. No, he said succinctly, just work harder. <laughs> well, that's what I did. And it wasn't until then that I learned that I could overcome challenging intellectual problems. So thanks to a rigorous environment, I thrived, committing myself after that to giving my best in all circumstances. Couldn't always predict the outcome to be brilliant, but I knew one thing that I had to apply myself, I had to work hard. And then I would be satisfied with, with whatever the outcome was. And that's why I applaud work environments that provide the ultimate advantage to workers, and especially to women and minorities. What do we need? Challenging work, honest assessment, insistence on improvement. Because frankly, nothing is more enabling than, a, than the moment that an individual learns how to deploy their strongest personal assets to solve a seemingly insurmountable problem or to create an important innovation. Now, there are several circumstances in which I was challenged to work at the top of my ability and, frankly, beyond. First of all, at Princeton, where I was associate dean, I completed an assignment and I turned it in to the dean. His response in reviewing my work was swift and cutting. He said quite simply that the work I submitted was the worst he had ever seen. And for a fact, he said that and kicked the file cabinet. I don't know if he was having a bad day, I know I was, <laughs> or whether he actually believed what he said, but his words cut me deeply. And so I did what I should do, what anybody should do perhaps, and I returned to my office, put my head on my desk and cried. But when I got over feeling bereft, again I went back to work and redid the assignment. There are two things that I remember about this incident. The first is that by accepting the, and incorporating his criticism, I improved my skills. And that put me on the path to understanding more fully the potential I had to make adjustments, to learn from mistakes, to work with others to address deficiencies. The second thing that I learned was not to take criticism as an indication of any animus on the part of, a cri of the critic or supervisor. The person who delivered this criticism became my greatest mentor and the person most responsible for my advancing to a presidency. He had my interests at heart. He pushed me to excel. 
when I most needed it, and he convinced me to accept the offer of a presidency because at the moment that I received the offer to go to Smith, I was afraid, and I said that I was going to turn it down. He is the one who pushed me to accept it because he believed that I could do it. Striving to be excellent in one's work does not always lead to immediate accolades. I learned to strive for excellence by first becoming a critic of myself, but also a critic of the humdrum, a critic of the assertion that things must remain the same, a critic of unfair policies, a critic of the obstacles put in place to bar access and preserve privilege. So for many years, my identity in the workplace was that of a critic, a misfit, a difficult person. People avoided me as the troublemaker that I actually was. <laughs> it was not until I understood that the burden of self-improvement and self-criticism was an obligation equal to that of trying to improve others. So I learned to listen, to be more discerning in my perceptions, to give others the benefit of the doubt on the same basis that I wished it for myself. And when I was able to do that, I became less of a critic and more of a team player, able to work alongside others, to listen to different approaches and persuade others of my point of view. So I'm grateful for every challenge that I faced that made me nimbler, smarter, tougher. People are often puzzled by the way that I've moved across culturally different institutions, and everybody must be able to do that. I've moved from the Goldman Sachs board to the Texas Instruments board to the Square board from a women's college to, my, to an Ivy League university to a historically black university. We create barriers based on, I don't know, a sense of elitism, maybe. I've always felt that where the, there is good work to do, we ought to try to do it. And one skill that we have that applies here also applies here. I've been committed to demonstrating that throughout my career. I think of these differences as minor, and I move among them easily because I see value in different approaches, and I do not try to import the same rules, roles, and ideas from one institution to another. Have you held up your sign yet? Not yet? OK. All right, then I'll keep going. While there are some central tenets of my work in philosophy, basically high quality work, adherence to fundamental fairness, the importance of communicating clearly, and so on. In the main, standards of excellence across sectors have much in common, no matter what one's profession, one's training, one's locus of work. I, joy, I, I get, got a lot of joy from the fact that people often ask me, well, what does have, being a French scholar have to do with advising Goldman Sachs. They're very puzzled by, by that because they don't understand the interconnectedness of what we all do when we set high standards, we, when we demand the most of our employees. The duty of care is, in my view, of paramount importance in the work that we all do. We strive to display deploy our skills honestly and fully in the service of a mission. That's so simple and powerfully motivating a principle that one is always startled that it is not followed by everyone. So working at the top of one's ability, mining one's experience with challenges, incorporating lessons of failure to achieve success, I've relied on all of these strategies to push forward in each leadership assignment I've had. I recommend these strategies to those whom I mentor, and I certainly recommend them to you today. Thank you so much for celebrating the potential of women around the world. Thank you for demonstrating every day that there are no achievements, no achievement barriers that are too high for women and girls to break through. Thank you so much.